So yeah, welcome to the session now. It's the last session, like two last two talks for today. So the speaker is uh, Wood Moldmaker from University of Amsterdam, and he's going to talk on notoids and open curves. Hi, thank you. Uh, can I just check that you can hear me all right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me share my slides. You can see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so yeah, thanks again. And I wanna thank the organizers as well for the opportunity to give a talk. Um, so this is about, about joint work with Roland van der Veen from Groningen. Okay, so let me introduce an open curve. Well, no, this is just a, a curve really. So I call it open to emphasize that this is not a closed curve, like a knot. So an open curve is just a smooth embedding of the interval and it's going to have open endpoints. And these things are used to model all, all sorts of things. So particularly I'm interested in proteins and DNA topology. So this is applications to biology, but there's also applications to chemistry and material science, for example, in polymers. And the main question we want to ask about these things is, what can we say about the knottedness of these open curves? So given an open curve, what knot is it tied in? And in some sense, we know the answer, it's obvious because Right, all open curves are ambient isotopy equivalent to each other. So, right, I can I can contract any open curve along its length to well, to contract it to a point or to a trivial open curve. And so, all open curves are equivalent, and none of them are knotted. Okay, so this is maybe technically correct, but not a very helpful answer. So, the question then is, what else can we manage uh, in this direction? So, one of the techniques that has been used classically to study these open curves is the following, which is the statistical closure. So the intuition for this is if we have right, an open curve that resembles a long knot where the endpoints are both very far away from any knottedness, then there is a can canonical closure. We just take the endpoints and we put them together to form a closed curve. And in an attempt to generalize this, we define the canonical closure, uh, not, sorry, the statistical closure. So what we do is we take our open curve and we put it inside of a large sphere. And for any point on the sphere, we can connect this point to the open ends. To form a closed curve and so almost always uh, this will form a knot where when i say almost always i mean right with respect to the natural measure on the on the sphere and so since we have a measure on the sphere we can say um if we let this range over all points on the sphere this construction then we can say which knot is most likely to occur and then we define this to be the statistical closure of the open curve and then study that knot all right so this is sort of cheating we, we want to study an open curve so we just close it um, but this, this this is a reasonable thing to do. And so in this talk, we'll sort of rework this idea of using a sphere like this um, to study open curves without having to close them. So we're going to keep them open and see what we can do. Okay, so here's the thing we want to move toward. This is called a knot measure. And this is basically, well, we want to study in, in knot theories, isotopy invariants. And we know now that since all open curves are isotopy equivalent, we cannot get any interesting isotopy invariants, but we can try to get the next best thing which I will, I'll call a knot measure. So in my opinion, this is the next best, best thing. What is it? So a knot measure is a function on open curves to some real vector space. And you should think of this vector space as, for example, the um, the set of values of some knot invariant tensor R. Okay, so just any real vector space, really. Um, and then what, what do we want for this knot measure? Well, we want it to vary continuously. So if we take our open curve and we perturb it slightly, then the knot measure should also change only slightly. So it has to be continuous. Okay, this is a natural thing to require. And then we want it to have the characteristics somehow of an ambient isotopy invariant. So what this means is we want whatever recipe we use to define the knot measure, we, we want it also to extend to knots. So right, if the if the open curve has a single singularity being that the endpoints agree, then we want this definition still to make sense. And moreover, what it then defines is we want that to be a knot invariant, actually. So not, ambient isotopy invariant. And what do I mean when I say uh, that this is not invariant? Now it's called phi bar, extension of phi. So what does this mean? Extension, what it means is if we have an open curve and we bring the endpoints together, okay, this is deforming the curve, so we know then that the knot measure is going to change continuously. So as we bring the endpoints together, we want this knot measure to converge to um, not invariant extension. So uh, as a shorthand for the informal equation, we want this here. As we bring the endpoints of the curve C together to close it, we want the knot measure to converge to some ambient isotopy invariant. 
So this is really the next best thing after amidisotopy invariance. So here's an example. This is a classical one, of course, uh, maybe the most classical. So it turns out that the Gauss linking integral uh, for closed curves, it gives you an integer, just the linking number between two, let's say, uh, yeah, a two link component, uh, linking number of a two-component link. It turns out that you can also define this for open chains with two components. So this an open chain with two components is just an open curve, but with two components instead of one, obviously. And so it turns out you can still define this, but it will give a real number instead of an integer. And as you bring the endpoints together, this will vary continuously and converge to the integer uh, that is the linking number of this link. Okay, so we want to produce more examples of these not measures, and this is the final result I'll be working towards. And for this, we move through what's called a notoid. So a notoid is really nothing but a not diagram, except that it's modeled on the interval rather than the circle. Right, so this is just a not diagram on some surface uh, that has two endpoints. We consider these up to Surface isotopies, as well as the ionized removes that we're familiar with, where we take note that the endpoints, uh, you can see my cursor, right? Sure. Okay. So um, let's say I take this endpoint here. I'm not allowed to move it under this crossing. So I'm not allowed to involve the endpoints in any ionized removes. And this ensures that we can get non trivial notoids. So already we see that these notoids cannot be in one to one correspondence with open curves because all open curves are trivial. And not all multi-sides are trivial. Okay, so we will focus uh, on the surfaces, namely the sphere, in which case we say that the multi-sides are spherical, or the plane, in which case they're planar. And I want to sort of elucidate the difference between these uh, with the example down here. Right, so here we see some multi-sides, and then particularly the fourth one on, on the right. Um, it turns out this is a non-trivial multi-sides. Right, so you can compute the variant for this and conclude that this is not a, not a trivial notoid on the plane. And the um, intuition for this is like, if we want to trivialize this diagram, we have to see this outer arc over here, pull it down there, and then we can get rid of this crossing with right after one. But if we pull this arc down, then we're going to have to cross these endpoints. That's not allowed. However, on the sphere, we can do this. So on the sphere, um, we can't pull this arc down, but what, what, we can, what we can do is we can put it up, out, out, out. And if we see the, the sphere as the one point compactification of the plane, then you can sort of arc through infinity, or if you like, you can sweep it along the back of the sphere uh, so that it ends up on the other side. And then we can undo this crossing, and then similarly, you can undo the other crossing. So this thing here on the right, it is trivial as a spherical nozoid, but not trivial as a player nozoid. And in general, the one point compactification of the plane being the sphere gives you a surjection from planar notoids to spherical ones. So planar notoids really carry more information in general than spherical ones. Okay. So these notoids, they are clearly sections of open curves, but like I said, this ca cannot be a one to one correspondence. And indeed, it's not even well defined. Here we have an open curve in three dimensional space. And I can project it down to get K2 down here. Which is a trivial notoid, as you can check. You can do the right of master two move on these two crossings to get rid of them. Uh, so K2 is trivial. If I project in a different direction to the left, then I can get K1 in this case. And K1 turns out to be a non trivial notoid. So there's no single notoid associated to any open curve, there's a whole range of them. So for any vector V on the unit sphere uh, in R3, so any unit vector is a point on the, on the unit sphere in R3. So for every V in S2, we define CV to be the multi diagram of plane from direction in the direction of V. And CV is going to be uh, a multi diagram, a valid one for almost all points of the sphere, where again, by almost all, I mean with respect to the standard measure on the sphere. Um, right, because what can go wrong? Well, we can map like an endpoint onto an arc, or we can create triple points or cusps, but this is all uh, happens on the measure zero subset of the sphere. So we don't need to worry about that too much. And then what I want you to note is that, um, right, like here, we can already see that you can get several different notoids from one open curve. And in, in general, this sets of all the open, uh, all the notoids associated to a single open curve may be very large. Okay, so this idea of using a, a sphere in this way, uh, right, to project in all the possible directions has been used uh, in this software called Noto ID, which is used for seeing proteins. And what it does, well, it does exactly what we just uh, discussed. So you get an open curve, you project into all sorts of directions, and then you color the sphere by the notoid you obtain. 
So any point of the sphere is colored by the Northoid type that the projection is in that direction generates. And it's intuitively clear, and also it has been shown uh, formally, but it's intuitively clear that right, if you change it slightly, if you perturb it a little bit, then shapes of these regions, the borders between different regions are going to also only change slightly. So this is sort of continuous in that sense. Okay, so we're going to use this now to produce dot measures. So this is the main result uh, I wanted to show you. And what it says, really, is that every spherical notoid invariant gives you a knot measure. So every invariant of spherical notoids produces a knot measure in the following way. If we have an invariant phi, then we define a phi on open curves as follows. We just project this in all different directions. So we consider all the CVs and evaluate our invariant on those. And then we integrate this. This is why we're working with real vector space, where I think this is the value that phi takes for R. Uh, we have to tensor by R so that we can hopefully integrate over this. And here we integrate over S2 minus X, where X is measure zero subset, where CV is not a valid multi diagram. But this measure zero, so for the integration, doesn't matter. And then we divide by 4 pi because well, that's the area of the unit sphere. Okay, that's fine. All right, so this is a very simple idea uh, integrate the value of the invariant over the sphere, and this turns out to give you um, a null measure. Okay, so this is a clear motivation for studying spherical nullites, right? So we already have the motivation for studying open curves, and now we know that we can study open curves using notoids, so then studying notoids in its own right becomes interesting. Uh, but this is only for spherical notoids. So I also wanted to talk about planar notoids. Let's see what we can do there. So for an invariant of planar notoids, we can still define the same integral just as well. Um, so I just rewrote it up there. And it does give you a continuous quantification of notoidness. So this, this will be continuous under the information of the open curve. And it's also going to carry more information, right? because there are more planar notoids and spherical ones. There's a canonical surjection given by the one-point compactification. And so um, if we're working with planar invariants, we expect these to be stronger and to carry more information about the open curve. However, the only problem is that this extra information we get isn't really, doesn't have the character of a, an ambient isotopy invariant. Because precisely in the sense that the other axioms, so continuity is fine, but the other axioms of a knot measure are not satisfied. So we don't get, um, doesn't extend naturally to the not invariant closure of converge to. And so I'll finish by telling you the obstruction to this. So, okay, let's start with associating notoid to a um, knot. So let k be any knot. And we represent it by some diagram. Then we define k bullets to be the notoid that's obtained from removing a small arc from the diagram somewhere. Uh, as long as we do it away from the crossings, anywhere is fine. So. Right after we remove a small arc, then we've added two endpoints to the knot, and so it becomes a knotoid. Okay, that's fine. And now the question is, okay, is this well-defined, by which I mean independent of the chosen diagram and of the place where we remove the arc? Okay, so it turns out for spherical knotoids, the answer is yes, this is invariant. So let's prove this. Um, here I have an example. So here's a trefoil, a cable diagram to trefoil on the left, on the right, and they differ by the arc being removed before or after a certain crossing. And so we want to relate these. Well, the obvious way, obviously what you want to do, right, is you want to move this arc over to two endpoints, but since these are notoids and we can't do that, this is not allowed. So this arc is somehow in the way. And what we do then, because we're on the sphere, we can do this, we can take the obstructing arc here, push it out, 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 past infinity, or, or swoop it along the back of the sphere. And then it ends up being on the other side of the endpoint, which is what we want. And then we just bring it back in. So this is the second step, bring it back into the place where it was before. And now we just end up with two randomized or one loops uh, or kinks, I guess you could call them. So we end up with these two kinks and we can remove those with the randomized or one move, obviously. And what I want to say is that if we want to do this in like a frame setting where we're working with frame diagrams, this still works because these, uh, these kinks are going to be oppositely oriented. So we can still cancel them even without using R1. Okay. So here we've now proven that the key bullet is well defined for spherical notoids, but it turns out that for planar notoids, this is not the case. By example, uh, left and the right soil bullet diagrams are known to be inequivalent as planar notoids. So there are invariants that distinguish these, so they can't be equivalent, obviously. And this is, in some sense, precisely the obstruction to getting not measures out of planar invariants. Because what goes wrong? Well, in this integral, the following can occur. 
when we bring the endpoints together, it might be the case that there's an arc lying precisely above those endpoints at home. Um, and then what happens is if I look at it from one side like this, then the overgoing arc appears to be on the right of these two endpoints. If I change slightly, I can get it to be on the left. And so I can get uh, significant contributions to uh, what, what we color these spheres. You can think of this. I can get significant regions that are colored by both of these cable diagrams. And in general, for planar nothoids, these cable are going to be inequivalent. So what ends up happening is as I bring the endpoints together, I cannot um, obtain a dominant nothoid out of the open curve. Right, like even if the endpoints are very, very close together, I can still look at it from two different angles and get two different nothoids. And so um, this is an obstruction to getting part three of the definition of a knot measure, which if you recall is that as I bring the endpoints together, I want to get some well-defined knot invariant. But if I cannot even pull out an, a dominant nothoid in this case, then there's not much I can do. And that's the obstruction. So let me recap this. Um, right, so open curves are found all over the place and we want to study them. Um, using methods from knot theory. And so it turns out that uh, spherical nothoid invariants can do this by defining knot measures. And this is very nice because nothoids are very closely resembling knots, right? So we can use methods from knot theory to study nothoids and then use that to apply this to open curves. Um, and then planar invariants also give you these continuous measures, but they're slightly less well behaved in the sense that they give stronger information about the open curve, but this information, this extra information they carry is sort of somehow less topological and more geometrical. So if you want, want to be a pure topologist about it, you had better use uh, spherical invariants. Then you can get this really ambient isotopy invariant characteristic to your knot measures. And if you just want as much as much information about your open curve or protein or whatever it is, if you want as much information as possible, then you can get more by using a planar knot like invariants. But then this information will be not very topological in, in that sense. Either way, we find applications both for planar and spherical nothoids, right, to, to model these open curves. And it's nice. So here are some references. Um, yeah, and that's all I want to say. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. So are there questions? Um can um so can I have a question just um does this uh, invariant detect the trivial uh, not toid? Does this detect the trivial not toid? Um, so which invariant specifically? Um, because what I defined is like uh, not measures are like a very large class of uh, invariants. And in particular, you can take, for example, um, right, the sort of trivially complete invariant that just associates to a notoid its equivalence class in, among notoids. And this will detect the unnotoid. But if I have an open curve that you may call unnotted, there will still be perhaps some angle to look at it from. Um, and from that perspective, it'll, it'll look like a notoid, right? If I have maybe a string of spaghetti that, that is curling around like this, then okay, you can say this is unknotted. But if I look at it from a nasty angle from above, it might look like a knot somehow. And then in the knot measure, this will give a, a non-trivial contribution. So in that sense, this these knot measures can detect uh, knottedness inside of non-knotted objects. Okay, but only, thank you. Uh, only in a weak sense, right? Because if I have a vertical spaghetti string, then almost all the directions I will look from, it'll be. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you. So I see in your references, new quantum invariants of planar notoids. So how do you uh, define quantum invariants? Are there ways of like using braids <laughs> in some way to get a notoid? Right, thanks for asking. Yeah, certainly. Um, so indeed, you can use what's called a braidoid, um, which have been yeah. studied by other people. Um, but the way we do it is really just in the Bishop way of just snipping your diagram into many, many pieces and then yeah. associating operators to each piece and putting them back together. Uh, 
but yeah, so this this uh, paper new invariant, new quantum invariant of planar null voids is what this material is from, um, and it's in preparation, so it'll be doing be, be done uh, soon. I'm not going to so put the, an exact date on that. The results will form a group. Like, uh, what sort of representation theory will you use to <coughs> define quantum invariants? Like? Um, this is just a representation theory of quantum groups that we know. Um, it actually turns out that you can use uh, the very same ingredients that you use to define quantum invariants of knots very naturally to define um, yeah, like same on knotoids. Hmm. The only thing you have to be careful with is that for knots, you have to, you end up getting framed yeah. invariants, right? And for knotoids, uh, it turns out that you have to be even more careful. So you have to add a second thing called a co-framing. So you'll have end up having biframed knotoids. Uh, so I have another paper about that. If you look up framed knotoids, you can you can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Thank you.